Hatred Pharma welcomes you to the ocean of practical knowledge about small animal practice. That is Hatred's YouTube channel. We are thankful to Dr. Vinod Kumar for sharing his practical tips with fellow veterinarians. Hello, my dear friends. This is a very important topic by which. dogs and cats are coming across with we know a lot of vector borne disorders diseases those are infectious diseases which are being transmitted by vectors those vectors we know very well we know a lot about ticks fleas mites louse flies all these things and we know certain things because all of the doctors who are listening to me as i know are well experienced and experts in dealing with clinical cases of dogs and cats these type of diseases like we call as vector borne diseases are one of the commonest diseases which we usually encounter nowadays like we have lot of complications with the rish anaplasma mycoplasma whatever it be we know certain aspects of these diseases also now as when i compiled all the matters regarding vector borne diseases and its management in dogs and cats i split the whole portion into three the first session deals with just to know about the know how of the disease their pathogenesis their epidemiology their route of entry etc and now now we are going through the first session where we deal with the etiological factors the pathogenesis etc of these vector borne diseases so with this little introduction let me start as we think about vector borne diseases we have to know about what a vector is a vector is in a simply simplified form i should say a vector is a small living object or a large living object which is carrying the causative organism from the infected host to a recipient thereby the recipient is getting the infection such a living being is a vector so if the human beings can act as vector then insects can act as vector helminths can act as vector so anything in this world can act as vector they can carry the infective agents from an infected agent subject to a non infected subject so we call the mass a vector so 
when these vectors are producing the disease or vectors are transmitting the disease we call it as a vector bond disease a vector bond disease commonly we in our clinic we say it is a vbd vbd vector bond disease according to the type of vector our significance or the study of our vector bond disease can be due to three different vectors number one is tick bond diseases number two is insect bond diseases number three is vector bond viral diseases okay tick bond diseases insect bond diseases and other viral diseases all these are vector bond diseases our main concern is with the tick bond diseases and our least concern is insect bond diseases and our nil concerned subject is vector bond viral diseases okay so let us take the tick bond diseases let us as a whole narrate which are the tick bond diseases all very well known notorious diseases which each and every doctor sitting in our webinar knows very well the number one notorious one which produces too much of anemia and hepatic and renal failures number one is babesiosis babesiosis we know babesiosis in bovines it is caused by babesia bovis and babesia bigemina in the bovine we will never miss that coffee colored urine even not the veterinarians in our place that is in my state that is kerala state even the para veterinary staff the attendance sweeper and even the farmer knows that if the cow is excreting coffee colored urine earlier it was a yellow powder yellow powder take two scoops of the powder mix it with or dilute or dissolve it in 20 ml distilled water or water which is boiled and then cooled then inject it so that the cow can be saved at least they knew it and nowadays that bernil yellow powder is being replaced by bernil ready to use injection or lot of other <coughs> companies injection is available and we will never miss it we all know as we said even the farmer or the quack will not miss it so that is regarding bovine babesiosis but what about canine babesiosis yes it's a threatening problem it's a threatening problem for me also in my clinic lot of ticks are there getting rid of the tick is very difficult though i am a person who teach other doctors and other people how to get rid of the ticks at times my hospital also has certain ticks inside my kennels 
So tick-borne diseases are very common. Babesiosis is otherwise known as pyroplasmosis because of the typical shape of the organism. In the dog and the cat, Babesiosis is being produced by two pyroplasms, Babesia gibsoni and Babesia canis. Babesia catti is also there, but I have never seen a catti. And even Babesia canis can infect cats also. So Babesia canis and Babesia gibsoni. Just I'm enlisting it. The second one is early shiosis. Early shiosis is otherwise known as canine monocytic early shiosis or CME. It is one of the oldest disease, tick bond disease, which we started diagnosing 25 30 years before when. The different stages of vector bond diseases or infectious thrombocytopenia was under primary studies. That is when we were in the college. And it is caused by Erlesia canis. We all know. Then the third tick bond disease that is the anaplasma. We all know the anaplasma in the bovines. Anaplasma bovis, anaplasma marginal, anaplasma central, etc. And this anaplasma in the bovines are also being transmitted by vectors such as the ticks. And in the bovine, it is the pathogenesis or the outcome of the pathogenesis is entirely different. The outcome is a production loss, drop in milk yield, etc. Ultimately, it comes to that thing. There is a drastic drop in the milk yield. But in canine and feline, there is small animal medicine. It's a matter of life threat and so anaplasmosis the species is also entirely different we have two species of anaplasma that is the anaplasma phagocytophilum and anaplasma platys simply keep in mind that babesia is an organism which harbor the RBC. Early Shea is an organism which harbors the WBC. Anaplasma is an organism which harbors the WBC. Just simply keep it in mind. So, anaplasma in canines are caused by anaplasma. Phagocytophilum, which produces a disease known as canine granulocytic erlichiosis or canine granulocytic anaplasmosis. This is termed such because anaplasma in canines, the anaplasma phagocytophilum can harbor the granulocytes we will come into detail and anaplasma plant is they harbor inside the cytoplasm of platelets so it is known as a cyclic thrombocytopenia then the next disease that is borreliosis borreliosis is caused by a spirochete known as 
Borrelia burgdorferi. Borrelia burgdorferi. It's a spirochete. We know something about spirochetes. Yes. We used to encounter spirochetes daily. Like leptospires. We have a lot of leptospirosis in our clinic. Suspected leptospirosis. Diagnosed leptospirosis. With the leptospira. Ectrohemorrhagia, pomonia, gripotyphosa. Leptospira ectrohemorrhagia. Pomona, Gripotyphosa, Canicola, Indorogans, Biflexa, so many leptospires we have. Latest we have the Leptospira autumnalis, Leptospira australis. These are very virulent strains of neo leptospires. Likewise, Borrelia is a spirochete, just like Leptospires, it is a spirochete. So, Borreliosis is caused by this spirochete. And Borreliosis is otherwise known as Lyme disease, L-Y-M-E Lyme, Lyme disease. Okay. Then the next vector bond disease, hepatozoonosis, caused by hepatozoon canis. Then hemoplasmosis, caused by mycoplasma hemocanis and mycoplasma hemophilis. So earlier, when we study in the veterinary college, the name for this hemoplasma was hemobartonella. Later it was identified that it's a mycoplasma organism and now it is added to the mycoplasmataceae family. And so this disease is caused by Mycoplasma hemocanis and Mycoplasma hemophilis. The old name was Hemobartonella canis and Hemobartonella felis. We will come into detail. Then the next VBD is Bartonellosis. See, Bartonella and Hemobartonella are entirely different. Bartonella is a rickettsial organism which causes cat scratch fever caused by Bartonella hensile. Then, ticks, as when they infect with more number of ticks, these ticks can transmit certain neurotoxins or they can inject certain neurotoxins into the blood circulation and these neurotoxins can produce a flaccid paralysis which is known as tick paralysis then we have in our webinar two insect bond diseases like filariasis of course filariasis is a disease of Kerala state and also all the coastal states and districts of our country. Hatford Pharma presents Raj Dogs Injection, Suspension and Tablets.
the safe option of antibiotic to breed resistant infections. Rajrox injection, doxycycline hydrochloride, 100 mg vial, root IV, presentation, 100 mg vial, Rajrox oral suspension, doxycycline monohydrate, 50 mg per 5 ml, root oral, presentation, 60 ml, Rajrox LB 100 tablets, Doxycycline Hyclate 100 mg plus Lactobacillus 60 million spores. Rajdox LB 200 tablets. Doxycycline Hyclate 200 mg plus Lactobacillus 60 million spores. Rajdox LB 300 tablets. Doxycycline Hyclate 300 mg plus Lactobacillus 60 million spores. Indications Leptospirosis, Early Chiosis, Anaplasmosis, Lyme, and Bacterial Infections. Dosage for dogs 5 to 10 mg per kg twice a day. For cats 10 mg per kg once a day. Root Oral. Presentation 1 into 10 tablets. You can book your order online at www.hatwit.com. Looking forward to a long-lasting business association. Thank you. But in central India, where the mosquitoes generally do not harbor microfilaria, will not produce this disease but doctors there should also know about this disease dirofilaria imitis is the commonest heartworm of dog but it is not found in india but dirofilaria repens is very commonly found in our country so also the non pathogenic species of filaria that is dipetalonema reconditum it is an older name and now it is acanthochilonema reconditum see this acanthochilonema reconditum will not actually produce a severe pathogenesis but If it is killed in large amounts, that itself can form a very small, a microemboli, producing arterial blockades or capillary blockades, leading to functional disorders such as ischemia, whatever it be. Then the last insect bond disease is nothing but. Leishmaniosis. We know the Leishmania of human beings. The Leishmania donovani and Leishmania tropica. Of course, tropical Leishmaniosis, Alazar, Dum Dum fever. See, all these are human diseases. We need not worry about the Leishmania donovani and Leishmania tropica. But sometimes we have to worry about the insect bond or the mosquito bond or the fly bond disease. It is Leishmania caused by Leishmania infantum. We have two species of Leishmania which produces Leishmaniosis in the dog. Leishmania infantum and Leishmania, Leishmania americanum. Need not worry about americanum, it is only in America, as we know. So, we are concerned about Leishmania infantum. So, our main concern is 
See, Dr. Vinod Kumar tells that most of the diseases which are produced or presented inside our clinic may be a VBD. Suppose a dog is presented with off-diet, anorectic, sometimes vomiting, sometimes polyuria, dysuria, stranguria, polyacuria, cough, sometimes ascites. So different, different, different symptoms. Can in all the symptoms we can say it is a VBD? Textbooks say and my experience say yes. Earlier, when we were dealing with, when I was dealing with epilepsy in dogs, I did never get concerned with BBDs. Epilepsy. Epilepsy, okay, neurological sign. We have to go with the neurological examination. But now I say, when you see epilepsy in a dog, parallel to all other treatments and investigation, you should give a course of doxycycline. Why? Because the one of the commonest causes of epilepsy is vector borne disease, maybe Babesia, maybe Anaplasma. So we have to suspect it. That's why I say, when we should suspect a VBD in a dog, when the dog or the when the dog is having See, it's regarding a dog only, when we should suspect. When it has persistent or intermittent fever. Okay, admissible. When it is dull, depressed, lethargic, weak, anorectic, etc. It's suddenly... One minute. So, my dear friends, I was actually in search of a chair. I wanted a chair to lean, lean back. I'm in my house. Now, on my background, you can see our world famous singer. It's my daughter's creation. So, When we should suspect a VBD in a dog, if it has a persistent or intermittent fever, if it is dull, depressed, lethargic, weak and anorectic suddenly. So, we say that the dog is weak, the dog is lethargic, okay, that is good. But when it goes weak, lethargic, Suddenly, see clearly the client will say that since yesterday it was okay, it didn't have any clinical signs. But suddenly from this morning it became too dull and depressed, not eating anything at all, not drinking any water, no milk, nothing at all. Always keeping the head lowered, 
and lying flat on the ground. We should suspect a sudden depression, weakness or lethargy. On clinical exam, the third thing, if you see, if you palpate, is splenomegaly. Splenomegaly is a wonderful clue. It's a wonderful clue. If you find splenomegaly in a dog with anorexia and depression, that means an immune process is going on. It could be a VBD. We should suspect the VBD there. And on a clinical examination, such a dog, sometimes you may be able to find the lymph node enlargement. In almost 95% of the cases of VBDs, you can see the lymph node enlargement. That is sure. Then, as we know, in all the VBDs, there will be thrombocytopenia, immune disorder, and in all such cases, you can see hemorrhagic disorders. Hemorrhagic disorders can be seen anywhere. Can be blood in urine, such as hematuria. Can be even visible on the skin, such as petechial hemorrhages, small dot like hemorrhages, petechial hemorrhages. So, petechial hemorrhages is so typical. How about the hemorrhages in dogs? The hemorrhage can be the smallest hemorrhage. The petechial hemorrhage. When it is little bit more large, we say it is an echymotic hemorrhage. Again, if it is large, we say it is a purpural hemorrhage. Again, when it is large, we say it is an extravasation. Extravasation. Again, when it is very large, there will be collection of blood. We say it is a hematoma. So, when there are petechial hemorrhages on the skin or sometimes it may be in the mucous membranes, examine the lip, the inner side of the lip, the gum, so the vestibular areas, the oral mucosa, the gums, etc. You can see the petechial hemorrhages. Sometimes you may be able to appreciate coffee colored urine of the dog. See, some of our doctors have mentioned coffee colored urine in the dog. It could be babesiosis. But actually what was happening was that the doctor was actually patient with bovine babesiosis because this doctor may be a mixer practitioner and his whole inclination is always towards the bovine side this is no, not a wonder because bovine doctors are excellent clever hard working clinicians these people are the really hard working people so When he or she, he or she, see a coffee colored urine in the dog, quite naturally he may relate it to the coffee colored urine in the cow also. So sometimes he thinks that again it is a babesiosis in the dog. It is not a wonder. 
So coffee colored urine can happen in dogs also. Bleeding disorders in the, in the, in the, inside the intestines such as melina. Melina we know it is bleeding inside the anterior segments of the small bowel. When there is bleeding inside the anterior segments of the small bowel, blood will stagnate or collect inside the intestine. By peristalsis, it will be moving distally, and when it is moving, that itself will get auto digested. And there will be biochemical changes in the iron content of the hemoglobin, which is released. And due to this, the stool will be turning black. Because oxidization of the ferric ions to ferrous ions takes place. This is what is happening in excess feeding with hematinics also. So the stool will be tarry dark in color or black in color so that is a melina then there could be epistaxis quite natural when there is thrombocytopenia in a VBD there will be epistaxis what I have seen is a very common clinical sign sometimes people Telephone me or sometimes bring the patient to me and they have told that my bitch is having a prolonged distress, a prolonged bleeding time in stress period. Yes. Nowadays, in such a condition, you should suspect that it is having a VBD. Got it? Whenever there is a prolonged proestrum in a bitch, you should suspect a VBD. Then, the recurrent hematoma of the ears. I have seen that the recurrent hematoma of the ears. My first observation was like this. The recurrent hematoma of the ears. One ear is having hematoma. Then after clearing by surgery, the second year got this hematoma and both the years on clinical examination there was no otitis externa at all. See otitis externa foreign bodies in the ear canal then parasites inside the ear canal etc can cause too much shaking of the ears scratching of the ears etc producing a rupture of the vessels producing ending in hematoma or is pinne or hot hematoma hot hematoma is the purest technical term which is used but later i found that in some dogs when i give quite accidentally when i gave doxycycline to certain dogs no recurrence of hematoma was there. So I studied into that aspect. In some of our patients with hematoma or is pinne or odd hematoma, I detected thrombocytopenia. So whenever there is a recurrent hematoma in a dog, along with all other possible factors, we should suspect thrombocytopenia also. A course of doxycycline can give good relief to such patients. And if the dog is having neurological signs, yes. Hatred Pharma presents Clinda Hat Range, Clinda Hat Syrup and Tablets. Lincosamide antibiotic systemic drug. A weapon to fight deadly infection with care.
Clinda Heart Tablets Clinda Mycin 250mg Tablets Clinda Mycin 600mg Tablets Clinda Heart Syrup Clinda Mycin 25mg per ml Indications Skin Infections Dental Osteomyelitis and protozoal infections including toxoplasmosis. Dosage for dogs 5.5 mg to 33 mg per kg every 12 hours. For cats 11 mg to 33 mg per kg once a day. Root Oral Presentation 1 into 10 tablets 60 ml. You can book your order online at www.hatbrit.com. Looking forward to a long lasting business association. Thank you. As I told earlier, shivering of the head, chorea, champing of the jaws, salivation, epileptic seizures, all these are symptoms which are occurring in VBDs also. So, when you see such symptoms, you should think of a VBD. In certain case, where a German Shepherd was presented with severe tick infestation, that is acariosis, it had intermittent convulsions or epileptic seizures and along with anti-convulsions I gave a course of doxycycline and corticosteroid it was having dramatic relief because earlier for months together it was being administered primidone as an anticonvulsant. And thereafter, phenobarbitone, etc., was administered, and there was no much relief. And that case was a challenge to us. I gave doxycycline in that dog with good relief I should say the epileptic seizure never recurred so out of my experience I should explain you that epileptic seizures can be produced due to VBDs especially chronic form of VBDs and more frequently in Babesia infection. Then, if a dog is presented with you where there is no response to routine and common antibiotics, when the dog is presented to you with mucous complaints become pale very recently, the client will say, it had lethargy since this morning. And then the dog is gasping like this. Immediately you will notice the tongue. Tongue is very pale. Immediately you will ask, how about this pallor? Did you notice this? Oh, no pallor was there, doctor. Yesterday also we did notice it. So, very recent pallor of mucous membranes. It's a clear clue that it is a VVD. Presence of ticks and fleas, obviously. Edema of various parts of the body, including the very commonly limbs and scrotum. Especially the hind limbs and scrotum. This will become edematous. And a pitting type of edema will occur. And earlier we thought that the scrotum is having 
hydro seal but against the human hydro seal this is entirely different the tube and the skin the circuits etc and the tunica albuginea due to chronic irritation and inflammation out of immune processes produces this edema scrotal edema but at the same time you can see that the testis is unaffected okay so such a case you can suspect that it could be a vbd you might have seen several times this scrotal edema this hind limb edema etc then in cases there is ascites and pulmonary involvement you can suspect the vbd in case the dog is having cough then in case that dog is having corneal pathologies especially the anterior uveitis in one or both eyes sometimes you can see hemorrhages into the anterior chamber that is hyphema or simply our clinical examination you can notice the anterior uveal inflammation and you the uv it is <coughs> then if you see leukocytopenia leukocytosis or thrombocytopenia these are the major hematological changes in a vbd so these are the aspects when you suspect when should you clearly stating when should you suspect a vbd in a dog when there is scrotal edema when there is hind limb edema when there is neurological signs such as epilepsy when there is splenomegaly when there is pallor of mucosa vein very recently when there is anorectic dull and depressed all on a sudden very recently when it has corneal pathologies no response to any antibiotics so in all these conditions you can say it is likely likely to have a vector bond disease this is the particularity of the dog now coming to the cat when should we we suspect a vector bond disease in a cat when the cat is having lethargy yes that too in the cat lethargy is not shown all on a sudden mostly it will be progressive when the cat is having lethargy very important clue is that if it is having a persistent diarrhea or a long standing diarrhea when it is having weakness anorexia etc okay that is normal because in any vbd or in any other disease it will be showing weakness and anorexia when it is showing fever icterus which are uncommon as in the dog see icterus etc are very commonly found in the dog than the cats so the main thing is diarrhea persistent diarrhea then nasal or ocular discharges if you see a persian cat with wet both the wet eyes weeping all the time with a swollen conjunctival mucosa slightly swollen eyelids and when you see that the third eyelid 
is edematous and protruding out of the medial acanthus. You should suspect a VBD in that cat. That is what I say. You should suspect a VBD. Especially, you should suspect mycoplasmosis. Then, if the cat is having pale mucous membranes, that also in the cat, normally it is a little bit pale. Not always pink in the normal cat. But it is if it is if the cat is having a really pale mucous membrane, or the cat is sneezing and having a respiratory infection, or the cat is having lameness, lameness due to polyarthritis. Those are due to immunological signs. If the dog is having, if the cat is having a recurrent urinary tract infection. So in such cases, in all these cases, we have to suspect a vector bond disease. So, when should you suspect a vector bond disease in a cat? If it is having recurrent UTI, if it is having lameness, if it is having long-standing diarrhea, if it is having nasal or ocular discharges, eye discharges, these are the main four symptoms. Then you can make use of the other symptoms also, like sneezing, respiratory infection, pale mucous membrane, anorexia, weakness, lethargy, etc. So in such cases, we should suspect BBD in the cat. So these were some areas where we could say which are the areas or which were the which are the clinical signs where you can suspect BBD in a dog as well as a cat. And now we will take each and every disease. The first one, babesiosis. One minute, please. Oh, so sorry because I couldn't plug it to the electricity source. So in current baby shows is. Current baby shows is, is being caused by Babisha Canis and Babisha Gibsoni. See, in Babisha Canis, on 
all these vector bond diseases whether it's or maybe she gives any these both of these are being propagated inside the erythrocytes and so it can destroy the erythrocytes producing a intravascular hemolysis producing hemolytic anemia and sometimes even hemolytic jaundice this canine babesiosis is being transmitted by the vector Rifficebalus sanguinis we know the brown dog tick so clinical signs such as fever anemia okay fever is substantial because during the phase of multiplication there will be fever anemia definitely there will be hemolytic anemia hemoglobinuria yes because there is intravascular hemolysis splenomegaly definitely due to an immune process anorexia of course icterus vomiting edema edema is due to the immune processes ascites again due to immune processes and changes in the osmolarity of plasma neurological signs it is very common in long standing cases of babesiosis hemorrhages definitely hemorrhages occur due to thrombocytopenia renal involvements hematological changes such as hemolytic anemia see earlier in our clinical pathology class we studied which are the hematological changes in hemolytic anemia in hemolytic anemia the mcv becomes low the mch becomes low but the mchc becomes high so that is the typicality of hemolytic anemia then in fact we can see the stomatocytes all those things in the hematology class thrombocytopenia all these clinical signs are substantial which can be seen in canine babesiosis so blood sample when it is taken and mixed with saline it may auto agglutinate but the differential diagnosis should be done with immune mediated hemolytic anemia how we can do this how we can go with how we can differentiate between immune mediated hemolytic anemia and canine babesiosis Hatwit Pharma introduces Ivaraz DT16 tablets Ivermectin 16 mg antiparasitic systemic drug give a solid punch to worms attack Ivermectin 16 mg tablets Ivaraz DT16 tablets indications in dogs Ivermectin is FDA approved only for use as a heartworm preventive in cats It is FDA approved for heart worm prevention and control of hookworms. It has also been used as a microfilaricide, ectoparasiticide and endoparasiticide. In dogs, used for generalized hemodicosis and sarcoptic mange, shell teliosis. Dosage for dogs: 0.2 mg to 0.4 mg per kg once a day. Root oral presentation 1 into 10 tablets 
You can book your order online on www.hatwit.com. Looking forward to a long-lasting business association. Thank you. Now I invite you to, to my earlier lectures in hematology and blood biochemistry. Let us go to the hematology class. We studied about spherocytes. Spherocytes, global cells, globular cells, which are highly pathognomonic to IMHA. Dacryocytes, teardrop shaped cells, highly pathognomonic. Then increased MCHC. See, these are the signs, these are the findings which we can find in, in our field conditions. Otherwise, we don't have any Coombs test outside. There is no method to differentiate between current babesiosis and IMHA in the field. All those things what we have in our hand. That is only this thing. Take the blood, make a smear, stain it well. How to stain it? Whether you are going to find out can Bavishya or Anaplasma, whatever it be, staining is very easy. We have the alcoholic stains such as right stain and Leishman stain. We have the aqueous based stains, that is a Jimsa stain. It is very easy. You make this smear. You dip it in a methylene, so methyl alcohol for fixing the smear. That is more better. Fix the smear well. The smear should be very thin and tongue shaped. Take our Jimsa stock solution. Jimsa stain stock solution. Take 0.5 ml. Take 5 ml of distilled water. Mix the 0.5 ml Jimsa stain with 5 ml distilled water. Mix well. So that is 1 is to 9 ratio. To that, add so we take it, it be freshly prepared. Thereby you are making a freshly prepared stain. Take the stain, pour it on the blood smear. Let it be stained for 40 to 45 minutes. Let it be there. After that, pour it off. Wash it in running water. Dry it. Examine under the high power, then the oil immersion. If at all there is a current babesia, you can see the babesia. How easy it is. Otherwise, if you have diff quick, that is good. But I don't have a diff quick because it is the availability is a big problem. A lot of our friends are having diff quick so for what we are doing all these things not only for detecting the baby shake canis or the baby shake gibsoni but also differentiating if you are not able to see the canis or the gibsoni by searing a teardrop by seeing a teardrop cell or see a lot of spherocytes You can say it is IMHA. At least you can say it is IMHA. Then after that you can give three, four days short of Dexona injection. By that IMHA will be reduced. So the vector of Ehrlichia is. Repisophilus. But Repisophilus 
they can transmit where some other diseases also like bartonella so we have to always see that there is a chance of concomitant infection when you look through the blood smear you can see either baby shake canis or baby shake gibsoni baby shake canis are large they are large cells large parasites pyriform in single paired or in multi scrolls intra erythrocytic larger than sometimes 50% of the diameter of the rbc so the that much large it will be i'll show you the picture baby shake gibsoni are seen seen in single small round and smaller than 50% of the diameter of the rbc sometimes even up to a size of 1/8 eighth, 1/8 eighth of an rbc and as i said the preferable stain is always gimsa after fixing it, it in 95% or methyl alcohol or by diff quick staining techniques for that capillary blood from the ear tip is preferable see if you are going to take the blood capillary blood from the ear tip of a ferocious rottweiler he will be having a very very tough time because the rottweiler may not be allowing you or if you are taking an adventurous occasion of course it could be your last blood taking so let us prefer the other end of the body take the tail clip off the hairs clip off the fur of that area from the tip make a prick there take the blood from there we need only one single drop for making a smear do it why are you going for the tip of the ears huh why are you going for it leave it take it from the tip of the tail that's all see this is babesia canis wonderfully stained the babesia canis inside the erythrocytes you can see it is seen in pairs pyriform appearance another smear you can see see in this also you can see the babesia canis which are seen in pairs you can see pyriform or pear shaped appearance of these organisms inside the erythrocyte you can see the mass poikilocytosis you can see the difference in shape the poikilocytosis it is due to the intravascular hemolysis so this is babesia canis so this is babesia gibsoni here you can see that they are small round organisms sometimes even up to the size of 1/8 of the rbc can be seen either as single mostly singular this so this is babesia gibsoni in our field conditions what we can do the most is making a thin smear staining and see otherwise if we are having too much of instrumentations like the pcr or the elisa kit of course you can go for it so these are abundant number of babesia gibsoni which can be seen inside the rbc but you can at the same time don't confuse with this thing see you can see bursels you can see nepo the hat shape mexican hat shaped cells that is cordocyte see this is a cordocyte this is a cordocyte these are different shapes in this is a bursel 
So maybe here Babishi Gibsoni can be seen here. Babishi Gibsoni can be seen here. But this is not Babishi Gibsoni. This is Howell Jolly Body. What is Howell Jolly Body? Yes. We have studied what it is. It is nothing but pycronotic nucleus. We have studied in that, what is it? Our hematology webinar. Inside the bone marrow, there will be primordial erythroblast. As when the primordial erythroblast getting older and older, it is maturing. Just before the maturation, nucleus will be lost. The mammalian RBC is enucleated. So at last when it is the mature erythrocyte, primordial erythroblast, then after different stages, the proribriblast, the metarubriblast, the rubriblast, prorubricyte, metarubricyte, the rubricyte, then the erythrocyte comes. So all these before the erythrocyte, they will be having small, small nucleus. As when it matches, nucleus will be forming. They will be, the size of the nucleus will be reducing and reducing. As when it reaches the adult stage, that is the releasing of a mature RBC, all the nucleus will be disappearing. But in some hemorrhagic diseases or hemorrhagic diseases, Immature RBCs will be sent due to the, see this is the problem, see the leptocyte, the Mexican hat shaped cell, can see the bar cell, the poikilocytosis or clear symptoms of a anemia. So immature cells has to be produced, released to the circulation. So immature cells will naturally contain a pycronotic nucleus or remnant nucleus inside. That is known as a Howell Jolly body. So, we should not confuse a Howell Jolly body with the Babesia. Babesia Gibson will be like this. Howell Jolly body will be clear round, deep staining inclusions, pycronotic nucleus. Okay. Other diagnostic test, I said if you have it, you can do indirect fluorescent antibody, enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, ELISA. PCR, etc. you can do, but I don't have those kits. I always rely upon, of course, if you are having PCR kit, it is highly diagnostic. If you are having LIC, you are into having a highly diagnostic value. You can charge for that also. PCR is the best. That was something related to Babesiosis. Then we are going to Ehrlichiosis. In Ehrlichiosis, otherwise known as canine monocytic Ehrlichiosis. Canine monocytic Ehrlichiosis, where the we have the acute phase, the subacute phase, and the chronic phase. See, we should not be concerned about all these phases because the commonly found is the acute phase or the chronic phase. And acute phase is comparatively rare also. It starts with, suddenly starts with the fever. I said earlier, in any VBD, there will be sudden onset of the disease. Like a fever, anorexia and depression. Also, there will be, in the acute phase starts with the fever, anorexia, weight loss, oculonasal discharges, lymphadenomegaly, megaly, lymph nodes in enlargement, there the blood study will show thrombocytopenia, non-regenerative anemia, leukocytopenia, etc. That is regarding the acute phase. And there also you can see depression, dyspnea, edema. Edema of the limbs and scrotum is very common in early shows. Edema of the limbs and scrotum, especially the hind limbs. All those in thrombocytopenia, you can see 
diamond skin lesions. If you see diamond skin lesion in a pig, you can say it is erysipelas, swine erysipelas. So the erysipelatrix rusiopathy. But if you see a diamond skin lesion on a dog skin, it could be early shiosis. Or it could be sometimes systemic lupus erythematosus. So that is the acute signs. Then the early shiosis, as in babesiosis, it again it is being transmitted by the rapicephalus. So do you think that the rapicephalus will come and bite the dog? Do you think that only babesia will enter the dog? No, 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 no. All these fellows will come, go and enter. Along with the babesia, the early she also will may enter. Bartonella also may enter. So, multiple organisms will enter by tick bite. And that is why it is said that the dangerous disease is a tick bite. That was something regarding the acute phase of early shiosis. Then the subclinical phase, we may not be noticing any clinical sign for months together. But suddenly some epistaxis can occur. Suddenly melina or hematuria can occur. Then only we could notice that there is some hemorrhagic disease going on you will check the blood you will find thrombocytopenia so in chronic subclinical forms thrombocytopenia may last from a month to four or five months or to even years they will be having the dog will be having thrombocytopenia whatever you give it will not respond you may be you see it is a Nowadays, it is, it is a trend to give antithrombocytopenia drugs like Caripril to those dogs which is having thrombocytopenia. Whenever you see thrombocytopenia dog, immediately start heavy doses of doxycycline. Caripril, etc. Is, it is not at all a significant therapy. We can give it. There is successful reports available. But at the same time, whenever you see there is thrombocytopenia, you start with the doxycycline orally. And in the chronic phase of the early shiosis, it shows depression, fever, weight loss, bleeding tendencies due to thrombocytopenia, pallor of the mucous membranes, abdominal tenderness, anterior uveitis, Retinal hemorrhages, neurological signs, and DICs. Bleeding tendencies, of course, it is substantial because there is thrombocytopenia. As I said, it may last for one month to four or five months or sometimes years. So there is chance of bleeding tendencies, pale mucous membranes. Of course, it is already said. Non regenerative anemia can occur. Abdominal pain, anterior uveitis. Anterior uveitis is extremely common in early shiosis. So it is said that whenever you see an opaque cornea in a dog, you can suspect any traumatic condition like keratitis or keratopathies foreign bodies etc of course it is good or dystichiasis or endropion <clears throat> all those things itc you can suspect hatred pharma introduces endrohat dt 200 tablets endrofloxacin 200 mg fluoroquinolone antibiotic systemic drug to clear these susceptible infections with healing touch endrofloxacin 200 mg tablets Endrohat DT 200 tablets. Uses and indications 
used in dogs and cats for management of bacterial infections susceptible to enrofloxacin lower urinary tract infections enteric infections and bacterial skin infections dosage for dogs 5 to 20 mg per kg every 24 hours at least 2 to 3 days for cats 5 mg per kg every 24 hours root oral presentation 1 into 10 tablets you can book your order online at www.hatwit.com looking forward to a long lasting business association thank you Hatwit Pharma introduces Endrohat 10 serum Endrofloxacin 10 mg per 5 ml Soroquinolone antibiotic systemic drug Now easiest way to administer Endrofloxacin in small breeds or exotic animals Yes Endrofloxacin in syrup form Endrohat 10 serum Endrofloxacin oral solution 10 mg per 5 ml Uses and indications Use in dogs and cats for the management of bacterial infections susceptible to enrofloxacin. Lower urinary tract infections, enteric infections, bacterial skin infections. Dosage for dogs: 5 to 20 mg per kg per day, every 24 hours for at least 2 to 3 days. Cats: 5 mg per kg every 24 hours. Root: oral. Presentation: 60 ml You can book your order online at www.hatwood.com Looking forward to a long lasting business association thank you At the same time you have to suspect trypanosomiasis Trypanosomiasis is a very dangerous disease which can cause corneal opacity then other such a disease is ehrlichiosis so anterior uveitis corneal pathology etc retinal hemorrhages that is very common because of thrombocytopenia neurological signs as i said earlier the neurological signs then the thrombocytopenic immunopathies such as disseminated intravascular coagulopathies these are all immune processes which can lead to the clinical signs if you see a dog like this immediately first of all think of corneal pathologies but if it is bilateral then what corneal pathology immediately you should think of systemic disorders like trypanosomiasis then ehrlichiosis okay these are the differential diagnosis we can have retinal hemorrhages which can be diagnosed only by a deep retinoscopy which cannot do here in our field conditions but the dog will become blind due to retinal hemorrhages you can go and examine by palpation of the peripheral lymph nodes <coughs> such a very lovely dog a very ferocious and a dangerous breed examining the submandibular parotid and the prescapular lymph node it is a dangerous and a very adventurous thing what you are going to do so better we have poor 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 lymph nodes like the inguinal lymph node like the popliteal lymph node go and palpate all these lymph nodes but the commonest lymph node to enlarge is the prescapular lymph node that is a problem with the ferocious dogs anyway you have to think of it we can palpate the lymph nodes on the neck chest armpits groin 
and behind the knees for enlargement. You can examine or observe for edema that is fitting type of edema on one hind limb or both the hind limbs. You can look for it. So whenever you see such limb edema, if it is only on one limb, better examine for local lesions also. Sometimes there you can see swelling of the scrotum is due to inflammatory edema of the tunica albuginea and dartos, the skin and the subcutis everywhere. When you palpate, the testes will be normal in size, but the scrotal sac will be very heavy and pendulous, and it is irreversible. If you want to get rid of it means you will have to conduct complete scrotal skin ablation. Then epistaxis, of course this is very commonly found in ehrlichiosis. As I said, when we think about melina, Melina and hematoshesia both can happen in the dog. So simply you can compare between the melina and the hematoshesia. Melina means it is dark, tarry, digested blood in feces, which shows that the bleeding points are in the anterior small bowels. But when it is compared with the blood in stools with the, that is known as hematoshesia it will be fresh blood mixed that means the bleeding is from the either from the colon especially the mid or the terminal colon so the blood is not digested so you can have a comparison between hematoshesia and marina Whatever it be, both these conditions can be seen in early shiosis. And blood has to be examined where you have to examine the leukocytes. So the leukocytes are less in number. So better you take the Windrobe's hematocrit tube, centrifuge it well, take out the tube, you can see the supernatant is stroccolored plasma. The decanid is a settled down RBCs. And in between, you can see the small white ring. That is a buffy cot. You aspirate all the plasma and throw it away. Put a dipstick into it. Take a drop. Put it on the slide. Smear it well, make a thin smear, dry it, either you can stain the dry smear or you can wet fix it and then smear. So likely if you have this buffy cot, that will be much more better. You can see mostly the leukocytes in it. Especially in that you can see the granulocytic leukocytes. Such as the lymphocytes and monocytes. Especially inside the monocytes, in the cytoplasm you can see the round deeply stained morula. Morula is the Infect, infective stage of the Ehrlichia. You can detect it if it is there. We will not miss it generally. Sometimes you can see the morula inside the lymphocytes also. It's minded that 
both are both doesn't have any granules at all both are granulocytes and if something like this are seen inside it is nothing but the early shias morula with all we have the clinical signs other methods are indirect fluorescent test and pcr of course we can go if we have the facility it is early shakanis inside the moral and nobody will miss this early shakanis so this is a monocyte you can see the nucleus there is no granules in the cytoplasm you can see only this thing in the cytoplasm so that is a morula so we have studied about uh, babesia then erlichia the third one that is anaplasma anaplasma we have two species anaplasma phagocytophilum and anaplasma platys anaplasma phagocytophilum are transmitted by ixodus anaplasma platys are transmitted by Repicephalus and the disease caused by anaplasma phagocytophilum is known as canine anaplasma or granulocytic relatiosis. So, other one was see in uh, early shade was canine monocytic relatiosis. Here it is granulocytic relatiosis or anaplasmosis because it is seen inside the neutrophils so granulocytic relatiosis which is caused by anaplasma phagocytophilum and so this we have two species anaplasma phagocytophilum and anaplasma platys anaplasma phagocytophilum again Morula is the most infective stage and morula is seen inside the granulocyte that is the neutrophils particularly and anaplasma platys is seen inside the platelets since it is seen inside the platelets it doesn't affect the other cells produces severe thrombocytopenia and we say it as cyclic thrombocytopenia canine cyclic thrombocytopenia or CCT and anaplasma phagocytopenia producer produces disease known as granulocytic relatiosis granulocytic relatiosis or we can say granulocytic anaplasmosis also CGA canine granulocytic anaplasmosis Coming to the clinical signs of granulocytic anaplasmosis or granulocytic early shiosis, as in any VBD, we have the onset of sudden onset of lethargy, anorexia fever, bleeding disorders such as ventricle mucus, ventricle bleedings, melina, hemorrhages, etc., lameness due to polyarthritis. Pale mucous membranes, diarrhea and vomiting, tachypnea, splenomegaly, enlarged lymph nodes, rarely cough, uveitis, limbedema, polyuria, and polydipsia. So there is a difference between early shiosis. In early shiosis, cough, uveitis, limbedema, etc., are very common. But here, in granulocytic early shiosis, these symptoms are rare, but lameness is very common. Lameness, diary, and vomiting. Then, definitely there will be thrombocytopenia. You can see the bleeding disorders such as petechial mucous veins, petechial hemorrhages, melina, epistaxis, etc. Only with the sudden onset of fever, etc., we cannot determine anything.
hope you are able to understand me well these are not very these are not complicated things so you can see the picture of petical hemorrhage you can see the petical hemorrhage see the petical hemorrhage pinpointed hemorrhages and generally you can see the because of brain is pain here in this case in canine cyclic thrombocytopenia where there is the causative factors anaplasma platys again it have the almost the same symptoms like a fever lethargy anorexia pale mucous membranes petechial hemorrhages nasal catarrhal discharges sanguinous discharges epistaxis lymphadenomegaly we cannot exactly distinguish from the clinical science whether it is cge or cct both are sharing same clinical science but it can be differentiated through a blood smear examination the same as in the early cases the morula stages can be detected whether it is a and a phagocytophilum or the platys morula can be detected in the respective cells like in the cge the morula can be detected in the neutrophils cytoplasm of the neutrophils and the morula stages can be detected in the cytoplasm of platelets in anaplasma platys infection see you can see CGE where the neutrophil is an immature neutrophil, a band cell neutrophil where you can see the inclusion that is a morula of anaplasma phagocytophilum. This is morula of anaplasma phagocytophilum. What about here you can see two neutrophils, lot of erythrocytes, and you can see the large thrombocytes. See very large thrombocytes inside the thrombocyte you can see the stained materials if something is being seen inside the stay in the cytoplasm of the thrombocyte it is nothing but cct only cyclic thrombocyte where I mean, it is the inclusions or the moral stages of anaplasma like this those were something regarding the pathogenesis and diagnosis of anaplasma phagocytophilum and anaplasma platys then coming to the borreliosis as i said they are spirochetes borrelia burgdorferi after having their primary multiplication they will localize in certain areas like the skin the synovial membrane brain etc the clinical signs here in borreliosis always mimic many other diseases so migraines is a typical clinical sign which is shown in which is shown in human beings but not seen in dogs there is fever lethargy and lymphadenomegaly there is polio arthritis there is protein losing nephropathies then another typicality is it will be having shifting lameness we all know the shifting lameness in the cow it is nothing but the three day fever or the ephemeral fever but the shifting lanes in the dog as when the client says that my dog was limping on the right four limb yesterday today no limping at all but last week it was limping the left four limb so the lameness is being shifted from one limb to the other the shifting lameness 
So shifting Lyme disease, Padagna morning to Lyme disease, Borrelia bugdorferi free infection. So this disease can be diagnosed only from the clinical science and in our field conditions we cannot do much expensive tests to pinpoint the disease of course in borreliosis in borrelia bugdorferi infection inside the laboratory we can do lot of things we can do the dark field microscopy Take the plasma and you can see if it you're not all in all stages in some stages some stages we the academicians may be able to see this Borrelia then culture in BSK2 medium LSR test can be employed indirect fluorescent test C6, C6 peptide ELISA, Western blot test for IgG, IgG of course you know, there can be false positive reactions even. Routine blood works showing leukocytosis, neutrophilia and thrombocytopenia. So in Borreliosis, you cannot depend upon the diagnostic test. Borrelia bugdorferi is being transmitted by Ixodus. So you cannot rely on the test in Borreliosis. We can just rely on the shifting lameness and all of the clinical signs. These are how the spirochete can be seen in dark field microscopy typical erythema migrans in the human beings leave it because it is not seen in dogs even though it is see it is extremely rare in human beings then the next disease that is hepatozoonosis see the hepatozoon canis primarily this is being transmitted by the vector and the vector will bite the host or the target animal they will inject the hepatozoon and this hepatozoon soon enters the body for primary multiplication and upon secondary multiplication it will localize in the liver to produce blood filled cavitations that is why it is known as hepatozoonosis and the clinical presentation ranges from mild subclinical form to severe life threatening disease but fortunately in our place I have never seen a life-threatening hepatozoonosis as when some studies were conducted in Madras Veterinary College long back they found most of the street dogs in Chennai city was harboring hepatozoon canis and so we could know that it's a very common finding and sometimes pathogenesis occurs which we term as hepatozoonosis Hatwit Pharma introduces Azithro Hat 300 tablets Azithromycin 300 mg the cure that embraces with care Azithromycin tablets 300 mg Azithro Hat 300 Macrolide antibiotic systemic drug Indications Broad spectrum antibiotic against gram-positive, 
gram negative and other organisms example mycoplasma pneumoniae and borrelia burgdorferi anti protozoal effect against babesia species and toxoplasma species dosage for dogs and cats 5 to 10 mg per kg once daily for 3 to 7 days root oral presentation 1 into 6 tablets you can book your order online at www.hatred.com looking forward to a long lasting business association thank you hatred pharma introduces azithro hat serum azithromycin 250 mg per 5 ml the cure that embraces with care azithromycin oral suspension 250 mg per 5 ml azithro hat serum macrolide antibiotic systemic drug indications broad spectrum antibiotic against gram positive gram negative and other organisms example mycoplasma pneumoniae borrelia burgdorferi anti protozoal effect against bacteria species and toxoplasma species dosage for dogs and cats 5 to 10 mg per kg once daily for 3 to 7 days root oral presentation 30 ml You can book your order online on www.hatwit.com. Looking forward to a long-lasting business association. Thank you. There will be fever, emaciation, lethargy, anorexia, lymphadenomegaly, pale mucous membranes associated with anemia. severe muscle pain the hepatozoonosis hepatozoon canis is being transmitted by the brown doctic rhipicephalus hepatozoon canis can be detected in the neutrophils and monocytes of course it is a well diagnosable disease no need for any other tests just look the blood you can see if at all it is seen it will be seen inside the leukocytes like elongated ellipsoidal brick like organisms it will be seen like this only that is something regarding the hepatozoon canis then hemoplasmosis we have hemoplasmosis earlier the name was hemobartonella hemobartonella we have two common species like the hemobartonella canis and hemobartonella felis the hemobartonella canis the nowadays it is being changed into mycoplasmataceae family now it is mycoplasma hemocanis and mycoplasma hemophilis transmitted by rhipicephalus so the clinical signs they are harboring the erythrocytes destroying the erythrocytes so an intravascular hemolysis as in babesiosis occurs so anemia hemolysis anorexia fever co infections like early shiosis and baby shiosis are very common because it's again being transmitted by rhipicephalus these are organisms which can be seen seen sticking to the surface of rbcs like this see you can see the rbc and you can see the coccoid organisms it is only schematic representation blood smear is coming you can see the organisms which are coccoid in nature can be seen sticking onto the periphery of rbcs see 
that is how we can differentiate it see this blood smear it is hemomatella canis or mycoplasma hemocanis you can see the chain of this is how mycoplasma hemocanis is found as a chain of organisms sticking onto the periphery of the rbcs see that is how mycoplasma hemocanis look like the mycoplasma hemophilies they are seen as individual organisms or in groups seen sticking onto the periphery of the rbcs see another slide of mycoplasma hemophilies you can see the organisms which are sticking to the surface of the erythrocyte that was something regarding mycoplasma hemocanis and mycoplasma hemophilis then we have to talk something about the filariasis even though filariasis is a very very vast topic it needs at least one hour regarding filariasis neurofilariamitis is the commonest heart to of dog it is not found in our country but sporadically it is being reported the thing is that we have to keep in mind certain things for differentiation the microfilaria or the young ones is a larvae of adult dirofilariamitis has no sheath the cephalic the head end is pointed and the tail end is also pointed and straight that is how we detect it is dirofilaria mitis the head end is pointed cephalic end is pointed tail end is also pointed and straight it's not curved it is straight that is how we differentiate whereas in the case of the non pathogenic dipetalonema recondicum or sorry dire dirofilaria mitis uh, repens in dirofilaria repens it will be having no sheath but the tail tip is curved and has an umbrella shaped handle ending like an umbrella handle and show you the picture microfilaria of dipetalonema recondita also has no sheath with the prominent cephalic hook and curved tail see if it is dirofilaria imitis take the individual microfilaria and see whether the tail is curved curved or not if it is straight it is dirofilaria imitis if it is curved it could be dirofilaria repens or dipetalonema recondytum dipetalonema recondytum doesn't have any antigen harmful antigen so it is not said to be non pathogenic and uh, dirofilaria repens they also are not very harmful harmful in nature because they are the prediction site of these adult worms are the any part of the body inside the muscles cutaneous tissue subcutaneous space everywhere but dirofilaria imitis if it is found the adult worms will block the pulmonary vessels producing congestive heart failure for the microfilaria detection generally we used to apply the wet film method take a small drop of blood put a cow slip examine under the low power itself we can see the microfilaria which is having a serpentine movement then not if not stechanic actually we are digesting the uh, erythrocytes intact erythrocytes with uh, phenol sorry not phenol uh, formaldehyde and then we are taking that blood 
See, leave it. We, we can use the wet film technique only. Then you can stain the blood smear. See whether the microfilary found is dirofilary hematitis or dipetalonium reconditum or dirofilaria repens. ELISA studies can be done. See, this is the microfilary. In Kerala state, finding this is very common. When you take the blood of any dog, almost 60 to 80 percent of the dogs, you can see this microfilaria. The serpentine movement itself can be seen in the wet film examination. See, when this microfilaria, it is having a straight tail end, it is definitely dirofilary hematitis. But if it is, the tail end is hooked like this, see this, hooked like this, curled one, it is dirofilary repens or dipetalonima reconditum. Then coming to the next disease, diagnosis of botanolosis. The organism is botanella hensile. If somebody says, somebody asks you, is this is very common in this, our country or is this very common in our place? Yes. So years before, lot of our children were having lymphadenomegaly. See, children, our lymphoid, lymph nodes, cervical lymph nodes are seen on the sides of the neck. neck as chains of lymph nodes, chain of lymph nodes. Children were having chain of lymph nodes. Naturally, if the child is being presented to the pediatrician, what will be he suspect? Definitely, generally he will suspect TB. The child will be subjected for Mantos blood test, Mantos test. Naturally, he became negative. At last, the pediatricians could diagnose that it was botanolosis. It was botanolosis after taking the smear from the lymph nodes, the aspirate from the lymph node. So that is botanola hensile. Actually, botanola hensile, it is a rickety shell which can harbor the cornea, the lacrimal gland, etc. What will happen after the tears, etc. will be having this organism. The cat will be doing like this and then licking at the paws. It will be scratching all the their face and their eyes and then at the tip of their claws, the organism will be there. Then what will happen, the child will go, will take the cat or the kitten, they will drop it on the shoulders, quite natural, keep it on the shoulders. Immediately the cat has a natural tendency that whenever it is let free, immediately the claw will come out to grip somewhere, to grip somewhere. Naturally they will grip onto the shoulders and small wounds, small wounds will happen. And so these organisms will be injected into the child's skin by a scratch or pricking, etc. That is why it is known as a cat scratch fever. It is highly zoonotic. Here we have to consider the zoonotic importance of the disease. That is why I have mentioned this disease in our webinar. The clinical science in Dogs and as uh, so clinical signs in cats include fever, lymphadenomegaly. See, I have already said that if there is prolonged lameness, prolonged diarrhea, prolonged UTI, recurrent UTI, etc., you have to suspect a VBD in a cat. So, lymphadenomegaly, gingivitis, uveitis, endocarditis, transient anemia persistent eosinophilia, 
urinary tract infections and poor reproductive performances they are the clinical signs of batonellosis see in our field conditions we cannot diagnose this from any blood test we can only assume but we can warn the children's parents that there is a chance like this should be aware of it Leishmaniosis is not so very common, but we have to keep in mind certain things. Like the Leishmania, they are, by, they are being transmitted by the Phlebotomus fly. And as when they enter, they enter the circulation, they will localize in lymph nodes. They will produce severe pathogenesis. pathogenesis. So there will be enlargement of enlargement means it is not small enlargement. There will be big, very large lymph nodes. Enlargement of single or multiple lymph nodes. Weight loss, anorexia weakness. So is this meniosis produces. Certain skin lesions such as alopecia, nodules, ulcers, hyperkeratosis, intense exfoliative dermatitis, mucocutaneous lesions, onychogryposis, that is claw hyperplasia. These are the skin lesions. So, in general, if you see any skin lesion which is oily, ulcerative, nodular, with alopecia, Intense exfoliative lesions, that means there is a cutaneous denudation, there is splenomegaly, epistaxis, hematuria, vomiting, diarrhea, chronic colitis, diarrhea, lameness, vasculitis, etc. So, along with this, all these clinical signs of a BBD, along with that, you have this oily greasy skin with exfoliative dermatitis enlarged very big prescapular lymph nodes chronic vomiting hematuria epistaxis etc nodular and ulcerative lesions on the skin if you see such things and not responding to any antibiotics then think of leishmaniosis leishmania infendum infection So in such conditions, the macrophages can be taken and the macrophages can be examined for amastigots in their cytoplasm. But macrophages, finding the macrophages in the blood smear is a Herculean task. So from where we will get the macrophage? Either from the bone marrow aspirate or from the lymph node aspirate. Take it. If you are clever enough if we are competent enough we can see some then indirect fluorescent agglutination test elisa pcr etc can be made use of see this is a macrophage in fact the macrophage will be having fine granular cytoplasm and with abundant cytoplasm and that you can see the lot of amastigots if it is positive for Leishmania. Then the last disease where we should study the pathogenesis is the tick paralysis. Coming to the clinical science of tick paralysis, it is very common and very commonly presented to our clinic. Like it has leg weakness, sometimes it may be having shivering of the hind limbs with ataxia what i have seen they may be having respiratory involvements with inspiratory dyspnea as if it is having a rabies sometimes you may think that a, a very thin dog is having a staggering gait paralysis of the lower jaw weakness of hind limbs 
of course we may think that it could be rabies but it could be tick paralysis on close observation you can see a deep a crevice on the skin known as a tick crater where the tick bites and producing a deep area that's not a tick crater mostly there will be mega esophagus and regurgitation it will be vomiting they will client will be telling that it is vomiting but it is actually mega esophagus it is due to mega esophagus is so typical and not only for any single disease you keep in mind mega esophagus is a sequel to almost all the vector bond diseases whether it is babesia leishmania anaplasma borrelia or hemobotanella or botanella whatever be the disease yeah, everything is being created by the tick so when the tick is tick bites it can inject lot of neurotoxins these neurotoxins can damage the innervations of the uh, esophagus esophageal wall producing relaxation of the esophageal muscularis enlargement of the esophagus that is mega esophagus and subsequent regur regurgitation and there will be paralysis of the skeletal muscles sometimes become recum recumbent differential diagnosis should be from botulism encephalomyelitis heavy metal poisoning etc so tick paralysis it is very commonly found in our clinic so always keep in mind this thing this mega esophagus so typical and so with now i am winding up my dear friends it is now five now i am winding it up and now we have come across with uh, the commonest vector bond diseases in dogs and cats which are commonly found their pathogenesis their different features their uh, diagnostic common diagnosis the commonest diagnostic tests employed the smear studies hematological parameters etc we have found so thank you my dear friends